My Safety Training Online presents Safety and the Supervisor. Safety and the Supervisor will describe and discuss rules for the workplaces, detail supervisor responsibilities to provide resources and support, define adequate supervision and describe how supervisors can meet this requirement, We'll discuss the benefits and the nature of supervisor involvement in safety training. We'll describe supervisor responsibilities for holding employees accountable for safety. The General Duty Clause, Section 51A states the employer shall see that workers are properly instructed and supervised in the safe operation of any machinery, tools, equipment, process, or practice in which they are authorized to use and apply. Safety and education requires skills, knowledge, attitude, and training. Section 1, Introduction to Safety and the Supervisor. What is safety education? Generally, the why in safety describes the consequences of performance. Natural consequences equal explains the resulting hurt or health that occurs automatically as a result of our actions. System consequences equals the explanation that the organization's punishment or reward that may or may not occur as a result of our actions. Why is it important to always discuss the natural and system consequences of employee behavior? What is safety training? The how in safety primarily increases specific knowledge and skills. Why should supervisors be involved in training? How does a supervisor know that safety training is effective? Poor safety performance may not result be the result of training deficiency. Describe the safety performance discrepancy or the gap. Is there a deficiency in knowledge, ability, or skill? If yes, the employee does not know how to do the task safely. If no, the employee does know how to do the task safely. Has the employee performed the task before? If no, conduct formal training. Is a task accomplished often? If no, conduct practice. If yes, provide feedback. Here are two questions which need to be asked with every work training situation. Are the resources adequate? If yes, is the supervision adequate? Is the discipline adequate? Is the leadership adequate? You may need to improve your accountability system or improve your safety leadership. The decision tree is useful in demonstrating that deficiencies are not always training issues. Briefly process through the decision tree and give examples of each action. Remember, this decision tree refers to employees' performance. If you find there is no skill deficiency, does that automatically mean dis discipline is in order? Not so. If management has designed any of the conditions described in the non-training options, they have not fulfilled their accountabilities. Therefore, discipline is not in order. Do not tie non-training options to discipline. One mistake companies make is that they always think the answer to a deficiency is training. It may not be. 
Also, if one person is deficient, everyone gets trained. Fine for the person needing the training, but this solution is seen as a punishment for everyone else. Practice is necessary for emergency response crews and other critical operations. Section 2, On-the-Job Training, Safety and the Supervisor. What is on-the-job training? Let's give you an answer. Students will use this process later in presenting their OJT, or on-the-job training. What's neat about this procedure is that the education and training is occurring, and the measurement of knowledge and skills is occurring, will be in steps three through five. Emphasize step four to protect the worker. In OJ2 that does not involve hazards, step four could be eliminated. Step six is strong documentation is critical. If it isn't in writing, it didn't get done. Any attendance roster by itself merely certifies attendance, and that is not adequate. The basic steps of OJT involve first an introduction between the parties involved. Step two, the trainer showing and telling. With the, with the trainer explaining and performing each steps. Then the trainee observes each steps and questions. Step three involves the trainer asking and showing. The trainer, trainee explains each steps and responds. The trainer performs each steps and questions. In step four, the trainee tells and shows. The trainee explains, gets permission, then performs each step. The trainer gives permission, observes each step, and questions. In step five, the conclusion, a successful multiple demonstration of a new skill to the satisfaction of all parties involved. Step six involves strong documentation. If it isn't in writing, it didn't get done. Any, an attendance roster by itself again merely certifies attendance not at, and is not adequate. Step 7 is validation. Multiple training sessions depend on the individual and skill involved with each session that is documented. Now it's time for the participants to demonstrate just what has been discussed. Once again remember if it isn't in writing it didn't get done. Section 3, Safety, the Supervisor, and the Work Environment. OSHA General Duty Clause calls for employers to furnish a safe place of employment. Each, every employer shall furnish employment and a place of employment as well as adopting the use of such practices, means, and methods in operations and practices, processes, and do every other thing reasonably necessary to prevent injuries and illnesses. Okay, let's take a little closer look at the uh, General Duty Clause and some of the phrases inside of it. Reasonably necessary, employment, place of employment, safe and healthful, devices and safeguards, Practices, means, methods, operations, and processes. Okay, here's a question you need to ask yourself now as a supervisor. What can the supervisor do to make sure the physical environment is safe? List those steps of what you think. Okay, here's another question. What can the supervisor do to make sure the psychological environment is helpful? List what you think he should do, he or she should do. Supervisors, of course, enforce safety policies and rules. What the rule says, secure, enforce, require. They have a duty to comply with safety and health orders, decisions, and rules. Every employer, owner, employee, and other, self, uh, other person shall do everything necessary or proper in order to, to secure compliance with and in observance of every order, decision, direction, standard, rule, or regulation. 
The rules for the work for all workplaces call for employers' responsibilities. B. The employer shall take reasonably means to require employees to A. Conduct their workplace in compliance with safety rules in this code. And B. All injuries sh shall be reported immediately to the person in charge or other responsible representatives of the employer. The chain of accountability. The employer is accountable to OSHA rules and the employee is accountable to the employer. Consequences in the workplace. We do what we do because of the consequences. A great reference text that explains these four categories is How to Bring Out the Best in People by Aubrey Daniels. Positive Reinforcement. When effective positive reinforcement increases mandatory and discretionary behavior, the worker will perform to receive consequences. The worker may perform beyond minimum standards, and that is discretionary effort. The phrase, if I report a hazard, I will be recognized, or if I make a suggestion that saves us some money, I will be rewarded. What do employees think? If I make a suggestion that saves us money, I will be awarded. Negative reinforcement. When effective negative reinforcement increases, required behaviors only. Workers perform to avoid a consequence. The worker performs to minimum standard, just enough to get by. The focus is on compliance, which is fear-based. What do employees think? If I comply with safety rules, I won't be punished. Extinction of behaviors, withholding positive recognition of desired behaviors, will result in extinction. Ignoring employees extinguishes desired behaviors. Workers eventually perform without expectations of consequences. When the employee states, it doesn't matter how hard I work around here, apathy is rampant, but who cares? What's the most common supervisor response to good work? Ignore it. To be effective, discipline should be soon, sincere, significant, and certain. Section 4, Leadership and the Safety Supervisor. Leadership requires discipline when justified. It must comply with OSHA standards. Use provided resources. Provide effective safety training and effective supervision and ensures accountability for all involved. What are the two appropriate interventions when the supervisor observes a worker violating safety rules? If obligations are fulfilled, then discipline. If obligations are not fulfilled, then apologize. Once you're justified, leadership demands action. Keys to appropriate discipline. Discipline is based on fact, not feeling. Consistent throughout the organization, top to bottom, and laterally. Applied only when it's determined that management has met obligations to the employee. Is appropriate to the severity of the infraction and the impact on the organization. Here is a group discussion question. Should employees, supervisors, and managers all receive the same disciplinary action for a given infraction? Why or why not? Motivation is the key to effective discipline. The supervisor's motivation can make the difference between success and failure when disciplining. Which stated reason or motivation is below is likely more perceived as leadership by the employee. I am disciplining you because I have to. It's policy. If I don't, I might get in trouble. I am disciplining you because I want to. You're important. I don't want you to get hurt. I want to make sure you understand I insist on safe performance. 
When it comes to providing adequate supervision, what do the rules say? Section 51A of the General Duty Clause states, the employer shall see that workers are properly instructed and supervised in the safe operation of any machinery, tools, equipment, process, or practice in which they are authorized to use or apply. Every employer shall be responsible for providing a health environment, health, con health hazard control measures. Every employer shall inform employees. And the key to su safety su supervision is supervision. Every supervisor must identify and correct hazards before they cause illness or injury to an employee. Managers and supervisor activities should be listed to help ensure that effective supervision is occurring daily in the workplace. Four important procedures supervisors can use to identify and correct hazards are inspections, observation, job hazard analysis, and incident accident analysis. Section 4, the safety inspection and the supervisor. The general duty clause states all places of employment shall be inspected by a qualified person or persons as often as the type of operation or the character of the equipment requires. Defective equipment or unsafe conditions found by those inspections shall be replaced, repaired, remedied promptly. What is the major weakness in the safety inspection process? Informal observation is conducted continually by employees and supervisors. Formal observation procedures can be developed as analysis tool to assist safety staff in determining safety related trends. A safety committee observation process and job hazard analysis are forms of formal observation. Section 5, Job Hazard Analysis and the Supervisor. Effective use of job hazard analysis will do this. Provide the supervisor with a clear understanding of what the employee does and does not know about the task. Recognize the needed changes in the equipment or procedures. And provide a way to increase employee involvement. Here we can see a sample job hazard analysis showing the basic job steps, the hazards present, and a safe job procedure presented. Group Discretion Project. Why is it smart business for the supervisor to conduct a JHA with his or her suit workers? Section 6. Incident Accident Analysis and the Supervisor. Each employer shall investigate or cause to be investigated every lost time injury that the workers suffer in connection with their employment to determine the means that should be taken to prevent reoccurrence. The employer shall promptly install any safeguard to, correct, to take any corrective me measure indicated and or found to be advisable. Remember, accident investigation is accident fact-finding, not fault-finding. What is the primary purpose of incident accident analysis process? Well, if it's fault finding, you're conducting an accident investigation to primarily determine what happened and if the employer violated safety rules. Therefore, this kind of investigation primarily to, to fix the blame. This is a dead end road many safety investigations take. Accident investigation is far more helpful when the employer performs accident analysis primarily to determine what happened, 
the safety management system design or factors, performance factors that contributed to the conditions or behaviors that directly caused the accident. What should be the primary assumption when conducting an accident investigation? What happened? The safety or management system designs and what performance factors contributed to the condition or behaviors that caused the accident. The average cost for a disabling claim by event or exposure. What are the most frequent accident types in your state? And what are the most costly? Take a guess. Most injuries indirect costs are four times that of direct costs. Why is it smart to analyze incidents as well as accidents? What are the benefits to the employer when employees report incidents and injuries immediately? Let's discuss the benefits of immediate reporting of injuries, near misses, and illnesses. Employees should never become disciplined for having an accident. Employees should be disciplined only for violating safety policies and rules. They should be disciplined only when determined that the safety management system did not contribute in any way to the violation. Dig up the root causes. Check out the chart for root causes, surface causes, and direct causes of injuries. The direct cause of injury. The cause of an injury describes the harmful transfer of energy. It may take the form of acoustic, excessive noise, vibration, chemical, corrosive, toxic, flammable, reactive, electrical, voltage, and current, kinetic, energy transferred from impact, and mechanical, components that move. The cause of injury describes the harmful transfer of energy and may take the form of mechanical, components that move or potentially stored energy in objects, or radiant, ionizing or non-ionizing radiation, thermal, excessive heat or extreme cold. Here are soft surface causes of accidents, which directly cause or contribute to an accident, specific or unique condition or behavior, exists or incurs close to the injury event, involves the victim and possibly others, existed or occurred at any time, anywhere by anyone. Root causes of an ac accident are inadequate safety management system design, poorly written or missing programs, plans, procedures, rules, which result in a lack of supervision, resources, enforcement, or training, under top management control and ultimately co the cause of, ac of most accidents, produces an inadequate system performance. Root causes of an accident include failure to carry out safety policies, programs and plans, processes, procedures and practices, pre-exist surface con causes, are under the control of management, and of course failure can occur anytime, anywhere. The effective incident accident investigation process gathers information, analyzes the facts, and implements solutions. When gathering information, first secure the scene. Step two, collect the facts about what happened. Analyze the facts. Step three, Develop the sequence of events. Step 4. Determine the surface and root causes for the accident. Step 5. Recommend corrective actions and management solutions. Step 6. Write the report. Section 5. Developing strategies for hazard control.
Engineering controls. Controlling the hazards which you identify. To investigation. What might be a suitable engineering control for each of the following? A 120 dBA noise level. A slippery fall. A toxic chemic present in the work environment. Personal protective equipment and hazard control. Interim measures which control the problem can be implemented in nearly all situations. Why are engineering controls considered superior to management control? What the rules say, set the example. OSHA says duty to comply with safety and health orders, decisions and rules. Every owner, employer, and employee and person shall o obey and comply with every requirement, every order, decision, direction, standard, rule, or regulation. Or do everything necessary or proper in order to secure compliance with an observance of every such order, decision, direction, standard, rule, or regulation. What is your employer's primary responsibility for health and safety? What does OSHA mean when it states secure compliance? Does the employer have a greater responsibility than the employee? for health and safety. OSHA states any supervisors or persons in charge of work are held to be agents of the employer in the discharge of their authorized duties and are at all times responsible for the execution in a safe manner of the work under their supervision. OSHA also states Supervisors are responsible for the safe conduct of their crew while under their supervision and the safety of all workers under their supervision. Since the supervisor is an agent of the employer, what is the legal impact if a supervisor violates a safety rule or ignores employees when they violate safety rules? Section 6, Leadership Part 2 and the Supervisor. Le what leadership is not? Leadership is not power. Power derives from status, money, ability to harm, access to media, control of materials, etc. A thug who sticks a gun in your back has power but does not have leadership. Leadership is not status. Status or position may enhance the opportunity for leadership. Some in with high status or position haven't a clue on how to lead. It is not authority. Persons may have subordinates but not followers. People will follow only if a person acts as a leader. Leadership is not management. Management is organizational skill. Managers preside over processes, functions, and programs. Leadership is not common sense. What is common sense? How do we develop it? Good sense is individual. Common sense will result in common leadership styles. Think of a supervisor who you have considered a leader and discuss the attributes that they have displayed. Leadership styles. Some work, some don't. 
Tough caring or tough controlling? High score on the right. Caring if I'm okay, you're okay, customer, supplier, it's all about you, servant, leader. High score on the left. You're controlling, I'm okay, you're not okay. Superior, subordinate, it's all about me, I'm the boss. The critical decision point, understanding the impact of safety leadership. What is the impact of your decision on, say, John Smith, or John's family, or John's co-workers? You, the supervisor, the company. Leaders understand cause and effect. If you want employees to care about their work, demonstrate care for employees. If you want honest and fair employee behavior, treat employees with honesty and fairness. If you want selfless performance, be selfless. If you want loyalty, be loyal. If a supervisor wants to increase employee trust, what must he or she do? Exercise. What is the cause? Discuss what might be the cause for each of the following effects in the workplace. Effect. Employees regularly bypass lockout tagout procedures. Possible cause. Discuss what might be the elements leading to that. Effect. Employees frequently submit suggestions directly to their supervisor. Possible cause. Discuss. Effect. A supervisor constantly pressures employees to work faster. Discuss the possible cause. The five secrets of effective recognition are it occurs soon, the employee is sure, the recognition is perceived as significant, and the recognition was perceived as being sincere. Remember, regularly recognize, reward, and you rarely will have to reprimand.